What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and with me today I have Christian Blatt, and we are going to be giving the Once Over to Train Spotting. And what pleasure? My pleasure and other people's pleasure. There will be spoilers. Give it a good once over. Giving us the once over. Giving him the once over. For Give me a once over. Down to give us the once over. For a routine once over. Once over. Oh, just once over lightly. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. Kaylee, I'm so excited to uh, get the chance to return the favor. You've been on my show. And, uh, you know, I think that we've worked the most on Husey's show. Yes. <clears throat> I'm so sorry that I lost my voice. You were yeah, you well, were choked up thinking about I'm Husey. Choked, ch choked up whenever I think about, uh, you know, <laughs> any moment of the day when you think about Husey, you're like, oh, where is he right now? Oh, drinking. But <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah, so it's uh, it's exciting to get to be on your show. And uh, when we first talked about it, you know, I was like, all right, let me try and think of uh, some movies. I think I was going to try and get something from the 70s. And then it just dawned on me how much I love this movie, Train Spotting, and how I think a lot of people have kind of a misconception. There's really two scenes that stand out, and that's what people think about. And I'm like, okay, but you're missing all the other stuff. There's like, a lot of other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to talk about with this movie. Train Spotting came out in 1996, and of course, it was directed by the amazing Danny Boyle who I absolutely love. I could watch The Beach again and again and again. And Sunshine, 28 Days Later, Slumdog Millionaire. Um, what else? 127 Hours. I always forget that that's him. Yeah. And of course, it is about a group of friends who live in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and are drug addicts. So the group of friends are Mark Renton, who's of course played by Ewan McGregor, who went on to become very, very famous. This is, I think you said it's his second film, right? I believe this is his second film, uh, but uh, Shallow Grave is definitely his first film because it says introducing Ewan McGregor. The, the producer let him read the script at Sundance, but wanted him to understand we're not offering it to you because he didn't actually want him for it, but Ewan McGregor read it and he's like, this is such a great script. So he kind of disappears for a little while. He gets super skinny. Uh, you know, because if you see him in uh, in Shallow Grave, he's not yeah. emaciated like this. And he shaved yeah, his head. Yeah, I think head. he lost 26 pounds yeah. for this. It's crazy. Yeah. So uh, because, I mean, he read the script and he knew, like, I, I need to be in this, you know. And, yeah, this is years before he'd go on to become a Jedi Knight and a yes. a DC supervillain and, you know, all the things that he would go on to do. Yeah. We also have Sick Boy, who is played by Johnny Lee Miller, um, who was in Hackers. And actually, that's, I think, how he got his role in Train Spotting. And I think that Boyle saw him in Hackers and was very yeah. impressed. I was zero cool. Zero cool? Crash 1,507 systems in one day? Biggest crash in history. Front page New York Times, August 10th, 1988. I thought you was black, man. You know, he's phenomenal. Like, people forget that, uh, you know, uh, when people think of Sherlock Holmes, they think of the British Benedict Cumberbatch series. But he did a Sherlock Holmes on CBS for, like, six yeah. seasons or something. He is definitely one of those underappreciated actors because when you see him in something, you're like, Johnny Miller's great. I think you're totally right. And, of course, Ewan McGregor as Mark is the narrator of the film. He is the main heroin addict. Sick Boy, his character is a little bit different, obviously. He plays a borderline sociopath. <laughs> like One of his most famous lines, I think, is the, I don't have friends, just associates. Yeah. So that's already giving us an idea. And he really, Johnny Lee Miller embodies that role. You feel his little facial expressions. You feel his disassociation with his friendships, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, really amazing what he does. Then, of course, we have Spud, who's played by Ewan Bremmer. And he, you mentioned Harmony Corinne a little bit ago. He is also Julian and Julian Donkey Boy which I fucking love that movie. The funny thing about Ewan Bremer is that uh, he'll show up and stuff. Like, he's in Wonder Woman, you know? And, yeah. And you're like, how what? did this yeah. in this movie? Yeah. And he actually played the character of Mark Renton in a uh, play adaptation of this. 
as well, you know, I which think, I think I, is I interesting. I think I read that at one point. Yeah, 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 yeah. that is interesting. Yeah, I, it's it would be weird to go from the character of Mark to the character of Spud. Spud is what I would just define as a complete degenerate. Um, he he doesn't have any motivation other than drugs at any point in time. Yeah, because when he's clean, he yeah. has this sort of like childlike wonder, and he has this appreciation for the world. He's yeah. such an optimist, despite the fact that uh, you know he has a, a crippling addiction to heroin. Yeah, some severe problems. Yeah. Then, of course, we have Tommy, who is played by Kevin McKidd, um, who I think went on to do Grey's Anatomy, but I've never actually yeah. seen that show, so I don't know. Yeah. Tommy is sort of, you know, in the – there's deleted scenes with Tommy where we would have gotten a little bit more of him. He's definitely in the background in the film. I would say arguably – well, either – Baby Dawn or probably Tommy, it's one of the most tragic things at the center of the story because of how preventable everything that happens to him is and how 100% everything that happens to him is the fault of his supposed best friends. Yes. Literally everything that happens to him stems from that moment where uh, Renton steals the sex tape. Yeah, he's a very tragic character. And um, not only does he take the background in the film, but he's also not on any of the promotional materials for it, which is only because he slept through the photo shoot, not because now he took a background. That's <laughs> not... very interesting. <laughs> yes. So it, uh, maybe the film was edited in order to accommodate for that a little bit. So some of those <laughs> scenes, I don't know. Um, but I do, I really like his character because you empathize with him so much. He, you, for me, is the most relatable of well, the game. he's the one where it's like, you guys are always going on about heroin, so let me see what it's all about. And I think that that's probably why, like, you know, people like me, I'm always like, yeah, no. I mean, I think uh, the Just Say No campaign did enough to make me think, like, yeah, I don't want to even try heroin that one time. Yep. You know? Yeah. Dare uh, did a great number on me. Yeah, I never tried I, uh, any drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point of this friendly little reminder. It can kill you. And if you've got to die for something, this sure as hell ain't it. Uh, yeah, I I think that uh, just the idea of it and, you know, watching this in the movie, I think that they they do a great job in showing how it works. But I I think that if someone were to see this film, and feel that it glorifies heroin. I'm like, did you watch the whole film? Because it does not do that. There are moments where you're taken out of context. You could feel like that. And there's some of the best filmmaking is, you know, right after, you know, they take a hit, you know, yeah. especially Renton's OD scene that I think a lot of people think of when they think of this movie. Kevin McKidd as, as Tommy, he is, yeah, he's like any of us who just happen to have a bunch of degenerate friends. And of course we have Bagby played by Robert Carlyle. So Begby is the only one who doesn't do heroin. Um, I think his line is, I don't do drugs, just people. I love uh, one of the, the first laughs, I think, that this movie, like big belly laughs that I, that I had when I saw this movie in the theater. Uh, he's like, no way without poison my body without shit. It's all chemicals as he like chugs like a gigantic, you know, tumbler of liquor and he's a little bit older than them you know i think in the, the is, sequel yes. they established that he got he got held back a couple of times in school so he is one of their school friends even though he looks a little bit older and i mean robert carlisle's fantastic i mean i think most people know him from the full monty which he's also great in that movie but of course a very different character very different very very different bit of this bit of that bit of the other mm -hmm. um and i think you know you touched on it a little bit also but i think that his character in this and his acting style is it's just absolutely amazing he could he could almost be the background character you know he yeah. he does play an important role but you could almost remove him from the film and still have the same kind of movie because Again, it's a movie about heroin, and he does not do heroin. He does add so much. What I'll say is that you need Begbie to be sort of the the literal anchor dragging down yeah. Renton, makes him realize, like, I don't know these people anything. I know they're my friends, you know? The, the sequence when Begbie and then Sick Boy come to London to stay with Renton, it just reinforces, like, I, uh, you know, these people are not really adding anything to my life, you know, but yeah. Begbie in particular, you know, once they have the money and he's still getting into bar fights, I think that we kind of see that's the moment where Renton's like, yeah, Renton. I, I, I gotta, I gotta get this, <laughs> I gotta take this cash and get out of here. Yeah. 
Trenton's character arc uh, because of Bagby definitely develops yeah. in different ways. This is Kelly McDonald's first film. Yes. And she plays Diane and she <laughs> hadn't really acted before. She, yeah. uh, she's the same age as me. So she's 20 in this movie. So even yeah. though she's playing 15 and she's so far beyond, she's like a better species than every other character in the movie. And uh, the the sequel reinforces that uh, they find a, a good way that makes sense to get her into it. And, yeah. uh, you know, just the, the, the best thing that could happen for Diane is uh, Mark Renton uh, leaving Scotland. Leaving, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, she really represents a form of wisdom and, and also naivety. She, at one point she calls um, Iggy Pop Ziggy Pop. You I know, love so that, yeah. <laughs> we, get, we get the idea that she is both far beyond this group of guys and also very remedial. You know, she doesn't necessarily have, she might understand how the world works in a way that they cannot understand, but she really is missing some of that general life knowledge in other ways. Right. It's a great reveal to find out that she is, you know, only a, a schoolgirl. And the reason why I want to make sure that we focus on her is one, it's a great character, but she's really the female character in this movie. And she's only in a few scenes. There are other female characters, you know, like the the girlfriends, you know, yep. Lizzie and uh, Spud's girlfriend. And, yep. you know, they have some scenes together. They have funny stuff, but they don't really command much of the scenes that they're in without her it's uh such it's way more of a male dominated story so i think it's a very important character again yeah. a minor character in, in the book but she's also a minor character in the film in, in terms of screen time but she's really important i think for for Renton. and you know kelly mcdonald went on to do has gone on to do so many great things that uh it's the idea i think she was you know, she worked in a bar and she heard about the audition so she's like all right I'll, I'll read for this part and that's how she ended up in this and it's amazing i think you you mentioned her age so i i think i read somewhere that during filming which the filming for this was extremely short i think under seven weeks which is insanity yeah. Um, but during filming, she was 19 and then it came out on her 20th birthday, which I thought was a very, what a fun way to celebrate your 20th birthday. Yeah. I, uh, I did not have a movie open for my 20th birthday. I couldn't tell you what I did. So tell me a little bit more about your experience with this movie. When did you first see it? What did you think about it? Well, when you're an old man like me, most of these movies you do see in the theater when they come out. So I believe it's 1996. Yep. Uh, Miramax did a great push for it. Uh, the you know they used Iggy Pop's Lust for Life in a lot of the promotional materials, and uh, was not a new song at the time. But I I I didn't go that deep on Iggy Pop, you know, at that point. So, uh, and you know they definitely sold it to me in a way of, oh yeah, this this looks really cool. But also on the poster, it says from the people who brought you Shallow Grave, which is Danny Boyle's first movie. When you, you know, when you grow up close enough to New York City, a lot of these movies that, you know, some people could never see in the theater. Like I saw Clerks in the theater, you know, movies yeah. that don't necessarily make it all the way out. Uh, and, and really like where I grew up, it was a lot of like. Oh yeah, I can't see that movie. I have to go into the city to see it. Train spotting was one that I went. Um, the uh, the the Harmony Korine movie Kids. I also took a special trip into the city to see that. That's and I would usually go. Reasonable. Yeah, I would usually go to the Angelica Film Center, which uh, I told an anecdote about when I was on with Husey that I don't need to repeat here. But I saw Jason yeah. confused there. Um, so you know, getting to see it in sort of that setting, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's the typical art house theater, but it, in a lot of ways it being in Greenwich village, it's like the art house theater. Yeah. So it was all a lot of, you know, like-minded people who have a threshold for kind of crazy outlandish things on the screen. And, uh, you know, I think it was a great place to see it because there was a lot of laughter. So did you like it right off the bat? No. Were, were you completely sold the first time I, that you saw it? Yeah, I was kind of blown away by the story it told and sort of, you know, that, it, it, you know, it's it, it, you pull back out from the story of this group of friends and, you know, every group of friends has that one guy who it's like, yeah, he's just been around forever. Francis Begbie, who is, you know, one of the, the greatest fictional characters uh, that uh, I've, I've ever seen on the screen. And um, yeah, I like this 
film so much that I read the book and the book is written in Scottish slang. So the way that they talk. Oh, wow. And, and it's really hard to follow. There's like a really thick glossary. You get about 20 minutes in or 20 pages in, you're starting to kind of get it. Uh, but it's 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 a little bit of a tough read. And Challenge, it's yeah. it's crazier than this movie. Like, you know, like Renton keeps this cantaloupe under his bed that he just masturbates into and it gets oh, of like really moldy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's just crazy stuff, you know, that it's like, yeah, all right, you're probably not going to put that on the screen, but they yeah. could have. I've heard that the book is a little bit more like vignettes of the character's yeah. days, which well, I think is interesting. It, it's a great point. The the stories, I think, in the book weren't really as, as tightly connected. It was just, you know, it was a junkie's story. It was Mark Renton's story, you know, as he deals with his uh his crippling heroin addiction i had a very different experience with this movie i watched this movie for the first time probably about 20 years ago and i hated it i everybody yeah. loved it and i did not get it and i think that at the time that i saw it it just went over my head because sure. when i rewatched it this week i was like this movie is amazing why <laughs> have i been sleeping on this all this time um i i felt like it was boring. I felt like it was challenging to understand in the same way that you were describing the dialect in um, Irvine Welsh, Welsh's book. It, it was there's those moments where people are speaking in really thick, you know, Scottish accents. It's a little hard to understand. I didn't understand anything about heroin. I was like completely. I, so I was like, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand if I should be happy for these people or sad for <laughs> these people or the euphoria that they're experiencing. And it's so quick paced that I got lost. Yeah. Well, I and... think the answer is you're supposed to feel all those things for all those yeah. people. Yes. And interestingly, sort of what you're talking about, um, I, I recently watched the, I watched the sequel actually last night and there was a conversation with Danny Boyle and some of the cast and what I didn't realize is like the first 20 minutes of the original film for release in the U S every actor redubbed their voices so that they sounded less Scottish. And, and then I think at a certain point, they just figure you'll get used to it uh, because you and McGregor was talking about how he downloaded it, you know, so he could watch it on the flight to Edinburgh uh, to do the second film. And he, he lives in the U S now. So he's like, yeah, so it was this version of the film that I hate. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and and but watching it the other day, it's like uh, that's them editing. Yeah, the, you know that that's them putting new Tones dialogue down. In. Yeah, yeah. I, it's like it, it is very tough to follow. I think I just didn't understand film at the point that I saw it. Like I don't think that I understood how movies worked well enough to be able to respect what this movie does because I think that what this movie does is absolutely incredible. Because really, at its heart, it is a gritty film filled with layers and depth and again these vignettes of life about friendship and loyalty and betrayal um and the consequences of your actions and that is really deep and i think i just wasn't there yet yeah i mean i think that uh in general movies are not filled with bad people doing bad things to each other uh with you know there's there's not you know there's not really a happy ending to this story you know it's uh basically you screw your friends over and it's it's a tight 90 minutes which is I it think, is part of what you're talking about is that it, it it really hits you fast you know it starts with that scene running to you know away from the cops to lust to life and it, 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 yes, it has to slow down at times, but I mean, the film really moves in that way. Yeah. And the, uh, there's deleted scenes on the, the DVD for the, the first film. And they, they talk about like, there's a lot of great scenes in here, but we really wanted it to be a 90 minute movie and all this stuff slowed it down. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I appreciate that on a lot of levels. Train spotting opens up with what is probably one of the most iconic scenes from the film, as well as one of the most copied scenes in any movie. Look, T Bag, just fork over the brown. which is the chase scene with, um, I just blanked on the name of the song, Lust for Life. 
Um, by, is by Ziggy Pop. By Ziggy Pop. As, also known as Iggy Pop. Yeah. Yes. Um, playing, and um, we get the wonderful narration talking about choosing a life. Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. It is a powerful way to start out a movie. Yeah, and the thing to know about Choose Life, they explain the Choose Life thing in the sequel, and it's basically their just say no. So it's like, it was a thing that they all started doing. And uh, I mean, that was such a huge part of the marketing. It's such a great way to start because you're using your just say no as your introduction to the story of a bunch of junkies uh, get high and try and get through life. Because, of course, Retton, as the narrator, ends that quote with, I choose not to choose life. Who needs reasons when you have heroin? So right. that is when you immediately know what this whole movie is going to be about. And all of this opening sequence introduces you not only to the topic of the film, but the pacing of the film. Because we're getting tons of quick cuts in between them playing soccer or football, smoking, um, you know, doing lots of things. Again, the chase scene. We get the character names with title cards, so we know who is important. Yeah. Um, and so you, right off the bat, know that it's almost going to feel like you are on heroin. You're, yeah. As you're watching this movie, I, like you are going to be overloaded with sensory stuff. You're going to, what is it, have an orgasm times 1,000 because you just, you can't even focus on one thing. Yeah, I mean, and multiple characters stress it. It's a very early in the film. The 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 girl who's basically with uh, Sick Boy, you know, she she says it's uh, better than any meat injection, better than any fucking cock. Why you got to say nasty shit? You know, and they really stress. It's like, oh yeah, it's like yeah, sex is good. This is way better. Way you know? better. And uh, it's like, oh yeah, but uh, you do see the the price of that. So uh, I'll I'll take your word for it, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Granton. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I'm good. Thanks, though. Um, so we get to see the very downtrodden flat, I suppose, that they are living in in Edinburgh or drug house. I don't even know. How yeah, to so call this it. is this is like Mother Superior's house. Yeah. It's like the drug den that they go to. It's uh, and Mother Superior is an interesting character that uh, factors in a little bit more in, in the book. But he has that name, as Renton says in the narration, because of the length of the his length habit. Of you don't usually see an old heroin addict, yeah. but he's he's an exception. And uh, spoiler for the sequel, uh, Spud is an old heroin addict in that film. Uh, so you don't get it a lot, though, because obviously yeah. it is not a lifestyle you can maintain. So, yeah, yeah, they have this just dingy, disgusting house that obviously what you're there for, you really don't care, you know? Yes. Yeah. And and this is the first time that we are introduced. So we get to see all of these junkies just kind of ruining their lives. And we also get to see baby Dawn on the floor. Yeah. Um, and the I think that the motif of all of the, you know, the main characters, all the drug addicts kind of writhing around on the floor in conjunction with the baby crawling on the floor, it really leads you into thinking about how this film is going to be about escapism and how maybe these characters um, are doing are turning to drugs because they don't want to be adults. They don't want to have to think about things. Um, they want to revert to that baby like state. Yeah, I think that's a great point. They, as Renton says, he doesn't want to choose life. He doesn't yes. want to choose any of those things. Uh, you know, like he says, you don't need it when you have heroin. You know, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. And the first time you see the baby crawling around, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess. I guess that's how that would happen. After this introduction to the junkies, we get the title card of the movie, which of course says train spotting. And um, Renton says, after all, I had work to do. And we get a train whistle. And this is, I believe, the only reference to trains in the whole movie. Well, they take the train yeah. ride out to the countryside. Yeah. And he, one. he does have train wallpaper in his childhood bedroom but yes the actual train spotting which i believe is just you know sitting there and watching the trains you know yes. i mean i think that that's what it refers to they felt like it's more the metaphor of yes. you know watching the world go by you while you're you know passed out on, on the floor 
Absolutely. And at this point now, the term has very much become synonymous with being so obsessed with a hobby. So in this film's case, the hobby is heroin, um, which I, you know, I don't know that you want to be obsessed with that hobby, but Renton decides that he is going to try to get clean and he locks himself in a room with tomato soup and mushroom soup and a big thing of ice cream as well as mouthwash i can't remember what else well there's also the buckets yes, one for course, urine very... one for feces one for vomitus uh, yes. and uh, those sort of like details are you know i'm sitting there seeing this movie for the first time and i'm just like this is brilliant and of course the way that that scene ends you know he gets himself you know he hammers the boards on the door he has like all of his detox stuff and uh then kaylee <laughs> He, and then what happens? He busts right through it so that he can yep. get more hit. <laughs> yes. Um, and that is when he goes to see his drug dealer, Mikey Forrester, who is actually, it's a cameo of the writer of the book, Irvine, Irvine Welsh. Irvine Welsh, yes. Um, and Mikey Forrester gives him some suppositories. What the fuck are these? Yes, opium suppositories. And I, I think the, the greatest line in that conversation is when Renton says, For all the good they've done me, I might as well have stuck them up my arse. Yes, yeah. Or arse, I guess yeah. is what he probably says. So funny. So I learned from the scene that heroin makes you constipated. <laughs> uh. I love it. He just, he, he bowls over uh, and he's like, I was no longer constipated. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think, I think we've, we've all been there, you know, like, oh, oh, no. Oh, now's the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, gotta and, literally run. And, and I love, and anytime that I've used a public toilet that maybe isn't up to snuff, I always think like, yes, but it's not the worst toilet in Scotland. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I love the sign for that also. So he yeah. makes it into the worst toilet in, in, um, in Scotland and um, shits a lot and then realizes, oh no, I have lost my suppositories, which I would like because I would like to be very high. Yes. Um, and this is when we get into, I think the first real surrealism of the film. Yes. And because... by the way, this is this is scene one where I talk about two scenes that are are big takeaways. There's others, but the, yes. this is one of the main ones. This is also the scene that I feel like could easily put someone off if you haven't gone to the theater to see it. You know, if you're watching it, you know, on streaming, and you're like, that toilet is possibly too much for some people. <laughs> Even though we all know. That's not real shit, you know? <laughs> it's not a pleasant scene to watch, but no. it, 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 I think it's a really interesting scene. I will give it that. It's probably one of the best toilet scenes in any movie ever. Yeah. I, I yeah. Uh, there you go. That's a special episode. Best toilet scenes in movies. Uh, I've been, trying to come up. I've been trying to do, um, because when I, as Lucy Tightbox for who are these podcasts, I did a toilet photo shoot. Um, and I've also done a Mandy photo shoot where I'm looking like Nicolas Cage on the toilet. And um, <laughs> so I, I have been considering doing the train spotting scene and doing a whole uh, toilet photo shoot thing well, you from can, movies. You can... <sighs> you can find the worst toilet in Rochester. Yeah. Oh, that uh, won't be hard. There's many. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing. Here's the little known fact, gentlemen. It might not be the men's room. That's all yeah, I oh, say. <laughs> absolutely. 100% accurate. It's way grosser uh, in the women's room. <laughs> but the interesting thing about this scene is, of course, just the production design, just the detail of every speck of shit that's yes. everywhere. It's, it's amazing. But then also when he dives into the toilet and he's swimming underneath and he's looking for the treasure, which is the opium suppositories. I think that, uh, it's, it, it is when you realize like, okay, this is going to be a little bit, eh, not stream of consciousness, but like you said, surreal. And I think that that brings up an interesting point, which is how much can we trust Renton as the narrator? Um, yeah. You know, he is a drug addict, and I think that one of, I don't want to call it a criticism, but one of the questions that I have with this film is very much, 
what would it have been if Renton hadn't been the narrator? What would it have been if we had gotten the storyline in a different way? Well, I think it would have been interesting if it was Spud because, you mm. know, he sees everything and he takes it all in. And then he kind of realized, you know, he also he doesn't kind of bring baggage to his opinions. You know what I mean? He, like I said, he kind of has a little bit of that like childlike wonder. He's very blunt. So I think he probably has the best understanding of all these things that happened you know, in, in this film. Yeah. You know, it also would have been interesting. I hadn't thought about hearing the story from the other characters' perspectives, but it would be interesting to hear it from Tommy's perspective. At least we know that Renton trusts Tommy. We get, um, yeah. you know, we get that Tommy is not a liar. We get that information. No. From and, and one so, of the best scenes with Tommy is when he uh, tells Renton, well, here's what really happened. The story yes. that Bagby told. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, that, yeah, that's one of the best Tommy moments in the movie. I absolutely yeah. love that. So coming out of the poop scene, I think that one of, of the things. <laughs> How many yeah. times do you say that on this show? Coming out of the poop scene. Coming out of the poop scene. Um, Mark, when he gets out of the toilet, again, now we're in the surrealism kind of universe. However, when he comes back into the real world, he is soaking wet, which we find out because his shoe does the little squish thing yeah. as he steps down. And, and so it's like it's it's taking the the fake drug impacted universe into the real world where now the drugs are impacting our relationships and our friendships and everything else that we're doing. Um, so I think that's a really powerful scene. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, it, it happens right around this point, he's just sort of mentioning, you know, his preparations for kicking heroin. He talks about how he obtained Valium from his mother, who in her own way is a drug addict. So there's a lot of that social commentary, you know, because we see the amount of drinking. We talk about Begbie, how that's all chemicals. You know, his his mom is a drug addict in her own way. And, you know, I think a, a lot of us are in our own way, you know. Absolutely. You know, well, I take this pill to help me sleep. And then if I'm a little tired, I might take this other one, you know. And, uh, you know, the <laughs> the... Uh, the Rolling Stones used to call that mother's little helper, but now you can get a prescription for those things, you know? Yes. And if you get a prescription, somehow you aren't looked down upon in the yeah. same way. Right. That, exactly. You know, <laughs> for some reason. Um, so at this point in the story, we find out that both um, Renton and Sick Boy are trying to get off heroin. And we get a scene that I don't necessarily think that that for me it was very impactful but i'd love to hear your take about it which you is the about scene... when they're in the park yes yeah well there's more stuff like that in the book that that this is the kind of thing they do to pass the time retin and sick boy is uh you think that there's a lot of talk about sean connery in the film have you got it in your shite i clear enough much money penny there's way more in the book in the book and by the way the uh when he's under the water in the toilet scene we see the the landmine from thunderball i believe and yeah. uh, it's because of just how much james bond not even james bond how much sean connery they don't mention a single roger moore movie they only talk about the sean connery because of course he's he's the only james bond that uh, matters uh, when yeah. you're scottish uh, or or otherwise so yeah basically that scene and i don't think it translates well watching it again that they're just trying to create mayhem so yeah. they use the bb gun to shoot the dog so that it, it mauls the the owner uh, but i don't know how well it actually works in the finished film um you know i feel like th there's not a deleted scene of more stuff like that there's not a longer cut but it's almost like in keeping your movie moving along, I don't know that you need that scene. If there's one scene to take out, their conversation's somewhat important, but it's mostly masked in talk about Sean Connery. I think that the most important part of that scene is that Renton's commentary about Sick Boy getting clean is that Sick Boy is getting clean just to spite Renton. Yeah. Take Sick Boy, for instance. He came off junk at the same time as me, not because he wanted to, you understand, but just to annoy me, just to show me how easily he could do it, thereby downgrading my own struggle. 
Just to um, show him how much just to show him how yeah. easy it is. And, and, you know? and you're right. I think that's the most important part of it is that that's their dynamic. He's like, oh, you're getting clean? Yeah, yeah, me too, you know? And, it, you know, lamenting the downward trajectory of Sean Connery's career with the name of the Rose being an otherwise blip, you know, is, yeah. uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, I love how grounded they all are in the yeah. Sean Connery talk. Everybody seems very acutely aware of death, which I suppose if you are a drug addict, you probably need to be. That is an interesting scene because, again, as I watched it this time, I felt like it was a nothingness scene for me, at least. But I remember the visuals of that scene so much. Yeah. So, I again, I hadn't watched this movie in almost 20 years, and I remembered that scene Maybe because it's so green and so peaceful, even yeah, though they have the BB gun. The BB gun is like, he's like holding it up like this. So yeah. it, it's like a, almost like a flagpole. It, it's very it's it's, it's, one, it's a great point that you make because it's one of the only green scenes in the whole movie. Yeah. It's all very dreary and, well, for lack of a better word, Scottish. It's shape being Scottish! You know, yes. and like it just looks like that. Um, it's also there's, I believe, a version of the trailer that starts off with the "Do you see the beast?" You know, the uh, yeah. Sean Connery impression that they do, and you know, I think it, it's sort of the the film is kind of framed around it in in that way. But yeah, it is a fairly memorable scene. I, again, I, it's not that important, but they do a good job in giving us as much as we need, and I think narration in a movie can be very tricky i think this is one where it really works though because it you know it helps us move it along without feeling lost you know i think if there wasn't the narration be like wait what just happened yeah oh absolutely because so many things happen in this film um we we see a lot of the characters just kind of interacting with each other so the next thing that we get is Begby telling the story about him playing pool and him being the hero of the story. He really makes it seem like he did a great job and he beat up this guy and everything is really cool. So squares up, casual like. What does a half cunt do? Shites it. Puts down his drink, turns, and gets the fuck out of there. And after that, what again was mine. And we get the real version of the story from Tommy. You always got the truth from Tommy. It was one of his major weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the the slang. Begby's playing absolute fucking gash, which, yeah. you know, obviously that's how terrible he's playing. Um, oh, yeah, the book. I, if I'm reminding using the slang. I was not ready for just how many times the C word got thrown around in the book. And really? They it as They use it as a term of affection. You know, Aww. they could be angry. You could be angry at a C world word, or it's like, oh yeah, this guy's a great C word, you know. Uh, Aw, well, I feel so much better about all the times I've been called it now. <laughs> After Tommy tells him that story, it's at Tommy's flat, and that's when he switches the tapes and yes. he takes the sex tape of uh, Tommy and Lizzie, Volume One. I, I was wondering how many of those tapes were there you know and he he only took yeah. volume one uh but well just to start out yeah he would have exactly. come back for he more if he had had yeah, the opportunity exactly. i mean you're not going to start with volume seven that's crazy <laughs> and as he watches that homemade sex tape um renton realizes that something important is missing from his life um he realizes that as he is coming off of heroin that hey maybe uh, my penis is working again <gasps> and i would like to meet women and the the club scene does it uh, and uh, it's interesting because generally a lot of the music in this film is not music that i would enjoy in any other setting but the way it's used in this film it uh, and i'm not talking about you know the, the classic songs i'm talking sort of about the brit pop stuff the stuff that was current at yeah the time, like the stuff that they have in the club it all kind of works it, it does work it all works really well uh but so it's used to great effect in the club when he's like trying to find women to dance. Blondie's Atomic, when he uh, sees Diane in the bar. It's, it is, it's used like perfectly as so much of the music is in this, that as soon as you see her, it kind of changes to, yeah. to that part of the song. But uh, yeah, the, the nightclub scene has that introduction of Diane. It also has something we talked about earlier it's the pair of guys talking about th their sexual frustrations and then the women in the bathroom Restroom, also talking yeah. about their sexual frustrations and the 
a quick excuse. What are you two talking about? Football! What are you talking about? Shopping! You know, that scene reminds me so much of like the tell me more, tell me more <laughs> from Greece. <laughs> like it is so it's the epitome of like this is the girl's version of what's happening. This is the guy's version of what's yeah. happening. Clearly, the reality is somewhere in the middle. And again, that's kind of how I feel about Renton's narration, which is, OK, this is the version of the story that we're getting from him. Did you get very far? Can yeah. we trust him? Um, and, and so I, I think it's a very effective scene. And I do think also to your point that the club scene, it marks a very important change in the soundtrack of this film. <laughs> so for me, the beginning half of this film, what we've talked to up until now, um, was most of the 1970s pop. So we have Iggy Pop, we have Lou Reed. We get a lot of that stuff. This club scene is the first time that we get that Brit pop from the 90s. And I think it is such a marked difference. And I think it's one of the things that gives, the, you know, this movie is constantly on top 20 lists of the best soundtrack. Uh, yeah, it's one of those rare ones where they put out a second soundtrack you know they yeah. put out the, the i had the cd of the first one i never got the second one but uh the, they put out another one which is usually a sign that uh, oh people are responding well to this yeah people like this so much and as you mentioned this is the first time that we get to meet diane um and Renton, his immediate response is that upon seeing her that he has fallen in love it's not even in lust it's that well he's in the look on her face when this guy who she had forgotten ran off to go get drinks catches up to her and she drinks both of their drinks and just storms out. And with that, Mark Renton had fallen in love. How do you not fall in love with that? I understand where Mark Renton's coming from. It's true. It's true. And so he chases her out of the bar and she calls his bluff in what is like the most incredible. I just love the idea of women being like, yeah, I, what are you, does this, is this going to work? Like. You getting in a nut club? Yeah. And there's that, uh, that moment that uh, as uh, you know, as as a, a man who was once a single man and trying to, uh, you know, meet women, as it were. Don't us girls just love that? Uh, there's very there's moments you'll always remember in your life, and when she leaves the the taxi cab door open, and I think it's the driver's like, "Are you getting in?" And he's like, well, "Oh." Yeah, 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 yeah. Like because obviously every indication from what she said was probably was get out of here. Yeah, I'm not interested. And instead, it was we were just uh, making sure he knew who was in charge. And uh, I think that the way that the sex scene is cut together is one very funny, but uh, it does make sure we see that uh, she is on top. And uh, you know that's probably for a guy coming off coming off junk. Uh, it's probably the best necessary. Case yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I haven't felt that good since actually Gamble scored against Holland in 1978. But it just, and we see stuff like this in movies, but where it cuts to the, the soccer, the football narration, you know, the goal vet video and the announcer's like, what a penetrating goal, you know? And I do like that this portion of the film, so it has all of the guys finally getting laid. Casual sex. So we get to see each one of their experiences or trying to get Is laid. It so, so Tommy is about to have sex with Lizzie. Which, by the way, you know, kudos to Lizzie. She's like, no, 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 I want to watch us while we do it. I'm yeah. Like, I want to watch ourselves while we're screwing. All right. Good for you, Lizzie. Very let, erotic. Just, let, let your man know what it is that you want, you yes. know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that is when they discover that the sex tape is missing. Where is it gone, Tommy? Well, it'll be here somewhere. The, the beginning the, of the downfall of Tommy. The, the tragic downfall of Tommy. And... It's, it is such a tragic thing, but it's the way that Lizzie's like, the fucking video shop! So every punter in extra is jerking off to your video! Just like her reaction. It is one of the, the most fun sections of the film. Yeah. And I think you need it because of uh, what comes next. I mean, really just Lizzie being mad at Tommy because of the video you don't realize just how terrible that downward spiral is going to be. Yeah. And uh, you know, the fact that it 
is, of course, uh, I was going to say Renton and Sick Boy's fault. It's only Renton's fault. Yeah. Sick Boy wasn't there. Sick Boy Sick watched Boy it because, yeah. look, if you if you've got a tape of your Sex friend tape, yeah. having sex with his girlfriend, like, you want to watch this? I'm like, yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Very curious. That's the horrible night slash morning that Tommy has. But of course, Spud also has a very horrible night. Um, he does not get to have sex because he's too drunk. And in the morning, he wakes up and realizes that he has shit the bed. <laughs> Yeah, and by the way, before uh, Gail like leaves him there in the guest room, the it's sort of the the thing that we're all afraid of. She like checks under the blanket, and she's like, "Oh, I'm not missing much anyway." And we're like, "Oh man, they really, they really do know." Yes. <laughs> they, they notice. They take notes. She's gonna tell her friends. You know, yep. like, yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's I mean, a lot of penis in this scene. We get to see almost everybody's penis. I think. Yeah, yeah. Begbie keeps it uh, in his yeah. trousers, but uh, everybody else. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, but I, I mean, look, we've probably found ourselves in embarrassing situations, but nothing compared to, uh, you know, sheets just coked and shit. <laughs> And, you know, the Gail's parents are so sweet. Ah, you know, we've all tied up. You know, the dad's like, well, yeah, I've tied one on too many. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's like, figured that he pissed the sheets. Yeah. And the mom's like, oh, well, let me take it. Like, oh, and by the way, team spot on that 100%. Like, no, no, you need to let me put this yeah. in the wash. What he should have done is gotten a trash bag and thrown away those sheets. That's oh, absolutely. And bought new ones and yeah. said, that's, yeah, why were you even trying to wash them? Like, <laughs> Well, you know, uh, when you, I guess when you're a junkie, you don't think yeah, about like, don't spending think about money on anything logic, the, anything you don't want to spend money on anything that's not heroin. Yeah, that's true. Um, so that is his very bad night, but I, I would definitely say that, um, Renton's night is the worst of the nights because in the morning he discovers that Diane okay. I... is not in fact of age. I don't see why not. Because it's illegal. That's why not. That is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is remember, this is the 90s. Yes. Uh, so you have an outward reaction of like, oh, this is a criminal. There could be a little bit of mental high fiving uh, for yourself when you realize it once you realize she's not going to press charges. <laughs> Break them away, toys. Um, I would say that his interaction with Diane's parents and you know the reaction is like oh are you her flatmates uh is very and he's like oh that's a good one you know it's lovely spud covers his girlfriend and her parents in shit that is a <laughs> way worse than realizing that your the girl that you just went home with is only well Wait. she'll be 16 next month but I will say this. I don't think that Spud cares nearly as much as Renton does. Like, I think Spud is going to forget about covering people and shit. Okay. He's not going to give – he – like, I would care if I did that because I yeah. am not an addict. But Spud is so over the top. He's laying in the street being incomprehensible. I you know, he does not give a fuck. Whereas Renton does actually seem to care about the fact that he has just banged a schoolgirl. He he is like, I don't want to hold your hand. I don't want to do anything with you. I cannot believe that you are young. Why, you know, like, no, this is absolutely not happening. He seems concerned about it. Yes. So Renton and, has and, a little bit more of a conscience. To, to your point, I think if he, if you had asked Spud a week after this about the time that he covered Gail's he family and shit, he'd be like, what? Yeah. Wait, when was that? What did I do that? You know, um, but yeah, it is one of the, 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 again, there's two great reveals of Diane the first time we see her. But then of course, when we see her in the school, schoolgirl uniform, uh, it is very funny. And uh, again, remember the nineties were a different time, but I, I do think that she obviously has a very mature understanding of the situation. You know, she's like, I'm, you know, she knows to hold it over. I was like, oh, no, you, oh, I yeah. want to see you again because yeah. otherwise I'll tell the police. And he's yeah. like, fuck, you know. But uh, I, I like that, yeah, he's walking to school with her and, like, you know, the other kids are kind of looking like, 
who's this old junkie walking with Diane. And I think she doesn't actually want to hold his hand, but she tries to, which I think is really funny because she yeah. knows he's like, get the fuck, you know, yeah. um, that walk to school is very funny. And I think if we had not seen her again, it still would have been impactful. But I, I think yeah. that they find a good way to use the character again. After that, um, Mark, Spud, Tommy, and Sick Boy all go for a walk. Um, oh, this is the actual, they take the train out to the countryside, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. This has one of my favorite, there's some really good monologues that Renton has. Obviously, they're in narration but this is when he just talks about being scottish which is not something i can relate to but yeah. the idea that uh, I, I don't hate the english they're just arseholes we on the other hand are colonized by arseholes with the lowest to the low and i'm like jesus christ yeah <laughs> you know? the scum of the fucking earth and i mean you think about it you know i've thought the same thing about uh, canada and australia it's like they have another country's leader on their money the most wretched, miserable, servile, pathetic trash that was ever shot into civilization. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and Scotland, I mean, there's a very, you know, there was the big movement that uh, they wanted to separate from the UK, you know, within Absolutely. recent years. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that scene is it's definitely about their friendship and like, what are we doing here? You know, but it's also one of the times where it comes through how distinctly Scottish this story is. It's a shite state of affairs to be in Tommy and all the fresh air in the world won't make any fucking difference. Yeah. I, and I think that Scotland and Edinburgh in particular become a character of the film. Yeah. Um, and, and this scene is what really solidifies that being so important. We get it a lot before this however we get to really see especially the poverty that's within edinburgh and the impact that that has on this group of friends it's it's really powerful yeah no i think that uh it, it's again it's sort of it's a bit of the roller coaster of this group of friends but it's also something i think we can all relate to you have the good time not to not the drug addiction part but you have the good times and you have the bad times and then the times where you're just sitting around now we don't usually take a train and in, in this, the countryside but when you have conversations like this it's usually after one or two too many beers Fuck off! and that's when you're actually like talking about the stuff you really think and yeah I think it's uh, some tremendous character development. And, uh, you know, this is all, again, the heart of this is seen as a movie about heroin. And of course it is, but it's also a movie about friendship and what that means and your priorities in terms of where your friends rank in terms of your drug addiction, your family life, your stealing money from your friends how, you know, to, navigate, these, how yeah. to navigate yeah navigate and the resolution to them being in the beautiful countryside is that they all decide that they're going to go back on heroin which again is kind of the opposite you would expect this to be this empowered moment where it's like you're in surrounded by all this beauty there's nothing bogging you down and instead they're all like yeah let's do heroin again that's well, i think it was great. the realization of like uh what's it all for uh, yeah let's let's go cook up you know <laughs> or around this time spud sick boy and i made a healthy informed democratic decision to get back on heroin as soon as possible which leads us into what is for me absolutely the saddest scene in the film which relates to baby dawn yeah and i don't think i'd watched this uh since i had kids i forgot how much time they spend on showing us baby dawn in the crib i even as a 20 year old i it was heartbreaking the way the scene unfolded but this is more with the passage of time you're like oh my god this is even so more. brutal and yes. i also understand that people would be like yeah i don't know if i can keep watching this movie and i'm like i get it it's very hard cool, dude. It was gonna be just fine. but i mean it, it all happens for a reason to show you like yeah just Remember, they're having fun. They're going out. They're doing stuff. But when you're high, you literally don't pay attention to anything that's going on, including your baby. 
And then we realize, uh, which I think is also a very powerful scene, that we realize that this was Sick Boy's Sick baby Boy. because of yeah. the way he reacted. It wasn't just the baby that died that day. And in true junkie fashion, he's like, fucking say something. And then Mark says, yeah, I'm cooking up. And then Allison says, can, can you get some for me? You know, because yeah. how else is she going to deal with something how, yeah. that's heartbreaking? And even so, Renton's like, so I cooked up and she got hit, but only after me. That went without saying. You know, yeah. he's, he's going to shoot up himself before he helps Allison. Yeah. It is, it is so, so tragic. And again, I think um, I was kind of talking earlier about how Baby Dawn is a representation of that escapism. And we get to see these adult characters behaving very childlike. And and so the death of of Baby Dawn, it really, almost everything at this point in the film has led me up to believe that Renton is not going to be alive in the end. Yeah, I am I, at the point where I am like, okay, this is going to be an anti-drug object lesson and the goal is going to be that Renton is dead. I, you know, there's no recovery at this point. At this point, we know that death is imminent. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember thinking that when I saw it, because you don't really know. And, you know, the fact that really only, you know, well, baby Dawn, but then also of the main group of friends, only one of them dies yeah. in this film. Which it, is shocking. It's shocking. After the extremely sad baby Dawn scene, we get the chase scene from the beginning of the film, but now it's in chronological order. So we got to see the the, the flash forward of it in the beginning yeah. of the film. But here we get the replay of the full scene, which is Mark and Spud um, and somebody else. Is it just Sick no Boy's Mark dead. and Stick Boy? Because Stick Boy, Boy hides beyond the wall, and he doesn't get caught. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and by the way, in the deleted scenes, when they're in that, they're, so they're stealing books, and this is in the book too. That it's such a, it's a dumb idea of all the things you could steal. I believe they're stealing books from the bookshop. Um, Diane is in that bookshop and sees them. This is a deleted scene, yeah. and and she's like, "Hi, Mark," and he's like, "Oh, oh." oh. She's like what are you doing? And it's when she, it's the first <laughs> time she realizes that he's, Oh, wow. This guy's bad news. Now she yeah. comes back later in the movie, despite this realization, possibly because of it. I don't know. They say that sometimes girls like a bad boy. I don't know. Um, I've never, never heard of it. I've never been a bad boy. So uh, I, I wouldn't know. It's again, another one of those examples where they're like, well, yeah, of course they cut that out. It really slowed it down. But the, you, as you said earlier, this chase scene that you've seen many times, they even they do a good way of touching on it in the in the sequel and just sort of reminding you, you know, of these places. And just the the song is so perfect. Lust for life. Oh, as, it's as amazing. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it it is even if somebody does just it's like I don't like this movie. You know, you didn't like this movie yeah. uh, when you saw it. Uh, it's it's hard to deny some of the the, the editing, the cinematography. Uh, the there's a scene we'll talk about in a moment that's just so beautifully shot. Uh, but uh, this is uh, probably there's a reason why the film starts off with kind of a flash forward to this because they know how great this sequence is. Yeah. Oh, I I completely completely agree with that. As a result of the chase scene, of course, both Spud and Renton get caught. Heroin addiction may explain your actions, but it does not excuse them. Spud is sentenced to six months in jail, and Renton is sentenced to continuing rehab. Yeah. Yeah, and he that's where he has this speech that uh, it's interesting because the book lets you see inside his head a few times. There's a couple of times where we're a little bit more aware of what he's doing. Here, you're like... The judge looks at him. He's like, are you, are you fucking with me right now? And Thank you, Your Honor. With God's help, I'll conquer this terrible affliction. And he's like, I got to take him at face value. If I see him again, I'm going to really yeah. come down twice as hard on this guy. The scene after where they're celebrating and then Spud's mom comes in Oof. and Begbie just mouths off at her. That wasn't a fair Spud going down and not me. Well, I still her up for your boy went down because he was a fucking smart heat. And if that's not your fault, then I don't know what is. That is, that's a really hard scene to watch. And during that scene, Renton is actually wishing that he went down instead of Spud. 
So he's he is feeling guilt over this, which I think is unique for him. Yeah, I think there's tremendous guilt. And I think that as we deal with the addiction of these characters, there are definitely times where they realize it would be easier if they died, you know, yeah. because to keep up the cycle, they know as we as an audience feel like it's impending that somebody's going to die. Uh, they, as the characters, they also know it. And they're yeah. just basically going through the motions. And maybe Renton feels, you know what? being locked up for six months is probably what I would need, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's all, it's all very hard to watch. Uh, but um, I, I, I guess Mark doesn't really learn his lesson. Does he Kaylee? No, I don't think that he does. <laughs> um, and sick boy within that scene. Also, he says, choose life again, but he does it with the little wink. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's it. I, I don't even know how to describe how I feel about that. You know, this is a, a moment of celebration, a moment of sorrow. And here we are coming back to this lesson of the film that's been so pounded into our heads. Yeah, Sick Boy, who was just the the one who was smartest about hiding from the police. You Which know? also, how was he able to hide like that? Uh, right. How did the cops not spot him? I, I guess that when you're in a hot pursuit like that, you don't think to check to the side. But yeah, I know the visual of him just ducking in there is yeah. pretty great. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's uh, it's another one of those moments. And of course, uh, Renton deals with that the only way he knows how, which is, again, some of the great filmmaking in this visually. Sort of that jump over the wall when he lands at Mother Superior's. What's on the menu this evening, sir? You know, uh, which I think is also in the trailer. It's the perfect time for that hit that he has. Ah, and what a hit that is. Um, this visually is the most exciting scene in the film because we get to see Renton as he overdoses and sinks into the floor. Perfect usage of the music. Lou Reed's perfect day begins as soon as he ODs and it plays throughout the whole thing. He, As he sinks into this floor, we get all of these shots of him looking out through the carpet as well as getting to yeah. see him getting enveloped. He is literally being devoured by his addiction in this scene. Um, and Mother Superior's response to that is to drag him outside and throw him into a taxi and send it off to the hospital. And, and puts the cash in his shirt pocket. Uh, yep. You could tell that this was not the, the first time the first that he's time. had to deal with that. The only reason that I knew he was still alive during the sequence is because you kept getting to see the world from his view. You keep getting right. to see the carpet on the sides of his eyes. And so that was what kept me grounded with, okay, he's Odin, but he is going to live through this because otherwise I wouldn't be able to see through what he's seen. And we get, like you were just saying with Perfect Day playing, right as he is gasping for air we get the line you're gonna reap what just what you sow yeah and it's like the the song is perfect the pacing of the song is perfect the visuals the cinematography it is just terrifying i i don't know i'd never really thought about ODing and how you get out of it and sort of that sequence at the hospital where the nurses are yelling at him and then they just inject him with something he's like <gasps> You know, and it's like, oh, it's kind of like that. Well, Pulp Fiction was only two years before this, you know, so it's, it seems like, oh, okay, I guess it's like adrenaline or something that they just basically stab you with. And, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, two Miramax films only two years apart have a heroin have overdose that, sequence. Yeah. Uh, the one of Pulp Fiction's played for more laughs, I think. Somebody uh, was thinking uh, about heroin at Miramax, it sounds like. Hmm, and I think we know who it was. Yeah. <laughs> but here it's much more clinical to just yes. get rented. Oh, very okay. much. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. At, as he's leaving the hospital, his parents take him home from the hospital and, you know, he's, he's kind of promising again that he won't be an addict and he's going to get clean. And they carry him into their house like a baby. Stupid babies need the most attention. And again, yeah. this is where I get this escapism sort of message that I keep getting throughout this film. He has been relegated to his childhood state. He no longer can do anything after this overdose. And so his parents decide that they are going to completely lock him up and not let him do anything. They're going to keep him where they can watch him. And while he, you know, 
detoxes. Yeah, I think you're right. I was noticing that this time because, you know, when I when I think back on the film, I don't remember his dad carrying him in like that. But obviously, yeah, it is like kind of a newborn baby just being placed, yeah. you know, in his bed. And, you know, it's very different than when he locks himself into his apartment, you know, yes. and the sort of emasculating nature, the, well, it's more in, in, infantilizing the idea that he's being treated like a child because it's exactly what he needs. He so needs they lock him in there. Like yes. And of course he's like, I just need one more fucking hit. And they're like, no, no more, no more methadone, no more clinics, you know? And I think that they heard enough of his promises and, yeah. you know, that's why they lock him up. I need one more fucking hit! This is also a very techno forward section of the film because we also get the hallucination sequence here which is another really hard to watch and really memorable sequence as as Renton is coming down and I don't know what do you what do you do coming off well, drugs I mean, yeah I mean it's you know I mean you John Lennon wrote that song cold turkey you know yes. I mean that's what yeah. it is it's like you go through all the you know withdrawals the, that's the word I was withdrawals uh, I believe they call them the shakes, you know, yeah. and he goes through all of it and, you know, there's a way to try to ease yourself off of it. And he knew what it was when he was stocking up his apartment, yeah. but here uh, it's he really just his that. parents trying to bring him food and stuff like that. And the hallucinations are great because I think what you start to realize is some of them might have actually happened. Now, I don't think that they came and visited him there, but they are conversations that we didn't see. Yeah. You know, I like that uh, Begbie shows up next to him in bed. Well, that's a good fucking laugh, isn't it? We are in the earlier scene, we heard uh, Diane singing in the shower. And so then there she is in her school uniform yeah. singing the same song. Obviously the culmination, the realization that he's going to come out of this fever dream for lack of a better word is i would say the most disturbing thing in the film <laughs> but i think it's so powerful because of that you know because we had the disgusting toilet we have baby dawn in the crib but you need that shot to inform her crawling on the ceiling and then of course her face turns around, uh, you know, very, uh, very exorcist. I was going to say know. doing the exorcist head twist. And that is, there are not a lot of moments in this film that are lengthy. Almost yeah. everything, very quick cuts. It's very much like um, the movie Spun. Where, you know, the entire point of it is that we're doing super quick cuts to make you feel like you're on drugs as you're watching this right. film. That scene, you see the baby's head, you see baby Don's head about to turn, and it takes a long time. Oh, stop! Oh, oh no! No, this is Stop! Oh! Yeah. It, it went on so much longer than I remembered because yeah. it had been a little while since I'd seen this film. And uh, I, you know, I had to concede this time. I, I understand people who get put off by this movie because, because of, of a, a couple of things. But I would hope that most people kind of hang in there and see it as a whole. And like, yeah, you know, I mean, it, you know, being addicted to anything is, uh, of course, terrible. And I think showing you the different sides of that is very important. And, you know, unfortunately, it uh, only starts to get tragic uh, from this point onward. One of the things that happened during it, so what I'm talking about earlier, when I'm saying that we're getting information that we didn't have before. Yeah. This is when we find out that, uh, you know, we, we touched on the fact that, uh, Tommy wanted to start using and very quickly uh, he kind of goes full junkie and uh, then it turns out that he's, I don't know whether he's got AIDS, he's HIV positive, I, you know, they're basically the same thing for the narrative of the story. Yeah. And, you know, when Tommy's not in the movie that much before this, it, uh, it it's even that much more jarring, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, Mark goes to Tommy's house and I had forgotten that obviously everybody that lives there realizes there's the graffiti. It says AIDS junkie scum. It's yep. painted next to his place. And then there's the word plague there. 
you know, very uh, 28 days later from uh, Danny. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, that idea that it's, you know, marked for the plague. And then we actually get to see Tommy and, you know, there's the, the scene prior to this when, you know, Mark's getting tested, which I don't think I realized the first time I saw that he was being tested for AIDS. Oh. But, uh, you know, where the, the nurse just kind of jabs it and it's very uncomfortable. You know, those are the, some very rough Scottish nurses in this film, Kaylee. <laughs> That was your takeaway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you know, for anybody that has that fetish, it's something to think about. But, it's something uh, really great. Yeah. yeah, but just sort of telling Tommy that uh, he was tested and he's clean, and Tommy has that look of like, "Well, good for you." That's nice. You know, but uh, everybody knows that he is not, uh, yes. and it's very apparent uh, for the drastic change in appearance of Tommy from the last time we saw him. Yeah. You know? When he's, you know, and Mark is the one who gives him the the money or he gives him the actual, he sells him the drugs, I think is what he does. That's right, because. Yeah, and so he Mark's gives him the money too. Yeah, so yeah, later he gives him the money in this scene, but yeah. Mark was the one who basically sold him his first hit. Yep. And uh, then in this one, he gives him money so that he can get more because he's, uh, you know, partially being a good friend, but he also knows that, Oh, this started because I stole that sex tape of him and Lizzie. I yeah. had no idea that this is where that would this get is, us. Yeah, this is where it's yeah. going to. I, and actually, you know, I know we're jumping forward in the film a little bit, but I think that it would be valuable for us to just talk through the end of Tommy's. Uh, yeah, character I, I think right it is now. important. Yeah. So, so Tommy, of course, we don't really get to see him. The other characters go through a couple of different things, but then we find out that they all need to return back to Scotland. They they're now in London, and yeah. um, they have to return back to Scotland because they have found out that Tommy has passed away. Thomas Mackenzie filled a number of different roles in our lives. In probably the most tragic way possible. A lot of times when people have AIDS, they die from, a, you know, like a, a flu or even a cold because their body can't fight off anything because yeah. it's so preoccupied by that one disease. And so that's what happens, as we alluded to earlier. He buys this kitten for Lizzie. She's not interested. So then he takes the kitten home. And yes, it is the... Does it say, is it toxic plasmosis? I think is what I he says. I believe so. Movie? Yeah, it is. I, I yeah, and I, like, I think that's why women good. are not allowed to change cat litter when they're pregnant. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And so, just the the guy at the funeral, I don't even know who that character is, who just explains it to him, yeah. and it it's that much more tragic. You know, it's not just one day he didn't wake up because of. AIDS, no, it's well, or drugs or drug. Yeah, he didn't OD. He yeah. didn't. It's the fact that he got this stupid cat to try and uh, win back Lizzie. To get to where we get the characters in London, um, Renton actually is talking with Diane and she tells him, You've got to find something new. And his yeah. response to that is that he decides that he's going to move to England. Going to London, it's like, oh, look at, you know, he's made a better life for himself. Yeah, you he know, he, has, he he chose life. He chose a job. He chose an apartment. He chose well, not a giant television, but he has a television. A television. Yeah, exactly. So he's got all that stuff and that montage is great. And yeah, it's again music that I would never choose to listen to, but it works so well uh, in this. And, you know, we're like, oh, everything's great for Renton. And then he's reading that letter from Diane. From Diane. And that's where she's like, uh, you know, uh, sick boy says hi. He's trying to get me to work for him. That the- Because he's a I, pimp and a pusher now. <laughs> he becomes a pimp, yeah. And there, there are deleted scenes that showcase more him actually sick boy actually being a pimp but so we have that moment where he is uh you know he's like yeah he's a pimp now but the it's just diane's letter mentions that uh francis begbie is wanted and then he hears the knock on his door 
and then Renton flips it over and we just hear Diane's voice repeat, Francis baby. And that is another one of those just enduring moments, just the way that they used the art of filmmaking. It's like, hey, remember that thing we just said? Yeah, here it is again. Everything was great. And now Bagby showed up at his fucking apartment. In yep. He sure did. And it turns out that he's wanted for a armed robbery where he used a fake gun and he yeah. does not understand why he could possibly be getting charged with armed robbery because of yeah, that. How, how could it be armed robbery if yes. it's a replica? So they live together and they smoke a butt ton of cigarettes. And that's the one thing that makes it worse is that uh, Sick Boy shows up. Yes. But uh, I, I love the shot of Renton coming home. And uh, I think the song is by a band named Pulp. Uh, and it talks about, you know, it talks about like living in kind of a shitty apartment and the, yeah. the elevators filled with piss is one of the lines that we're hearing as he walks down. And he hears Begbie celebrating because this horse that he bet 16 to one on uh, won. And Renton just hears him celebrating and just turns around. He's like, I, I can't, I, I don't, yeah. you know. Bye, boy! And, and angry Begbie is one thing, but I don't want to be around a happy Begbie. Yeah, I actually don't understand that entirely. So the with the horse race, so Begbie made Renton go and place the bet on the horse because Begbie's Correct. like, well, I can't leave the house because I'm wanted and everybody's going to recognize me. But then they Correct. celebrate this win um, at a nightclub where Begbie yes. just goes out with no disguise whatsoever. So like, why couldn't he so, go? The, that's a great um, point. Uh, I think that uh, you may have found a flaw in the storytelling. Dang it, however, <laughs> however, Begbie also, and as many of these characters are, are very lazy. He doesn't yeah. want to even go buy his own cigarettes. So he's yeah. possibly using that as an excuse. Buy me fucking cigarettes. But you're right, uh, you know. He's he doesn't even, you know, have on, you know, a, a hat or something. Yeah. So he's laying low. But it, it is a good question. But uh, that is, I think, the sequence that I that I was making sure didn't happen earlier. Renton's narration talking about, you know, how everything's changing. Even men and women are changing. A thousand years, there won't be men and women, just wankers. And unfortunately, nobody told Begbie. And uh that's, uh, of course, the very funny moment where he's making out in the car with what he thinks is a girl. Yes. And then he, he puts his hand between their legs and he's like, what the? Not and, a girl. Um, <laughs> Fuck. Not a girl and uh, not something he wants to joke about. Joke's a fucking joke. You mentioned that again. I'll cut you up. Most of the other characters, you could joke around about something like this. Like Sick Boy would probably laugh it off. Yeah. Uh, Begbie is uh, very threatened by it. <laughs> so. And and Begbie's response is to almost castrate Mark. Yeah. His response yeah. is uh, put a knife as close to Mark's dick as he possibly can. Yeah, I, I don't think we needed much more time in London. Uh, you know, no. I think that uh, this... This story happens in Edinburgh, specifically uh, Leith is the town that they they live in, you yeah. know, and just getting back there. And that's sort of what we were talking about earlier for Tommy's funeral. But uh, yes. that that sort of sets the tone for, I mean, the, the last sequence. It's not, I was going to say the, the final act of the movie, but we're well into the third act at this point when the idea of this skag deal comes along this guy mikey forrester who as you pointed out is irvine walsh he basically buys i don't know like 20 grand worth of heroin from these nervous russian sailors realizes what he's done gets very fucking nervous he wants rid of this right so he's looking to unload it at a, at a you know at, at a steal and I don't know how much they give him. They do say in the movie. Four grand. So they don't, they get it for, you know, like pennies on the dollar or pennies on the pound, whatever. Yeah. And then they just have to figure out, okay, now we have to figure out how to sell this. And of course, newly reinvented pimp, uh, Simon, sick boy, uh, does figure out, uh, he has the associates that can help him uh, offload this uh, bag of heroin you know, uh, this like duffel bag that's filled with heroin. And, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I love the idea that uh, they need somebody to test it out. And yes. Mark's the only one who can test it out. And he's like, all right, I'm clean. But, uh, and he's like, oh yeah, it's good. Oh, it's really fucking good. 
So I also don't understand this. Everybody has an excuse for why they can't be the one to test it out. And as I recall, I did not write this down, so I might remember incorrectly, but I believe that Sick Boy's excuse is that he was doing too good or or yeah. it was... Why That's was that excuse. not Retton's excuse as well? I Retton think just Retton, wanted to do it? I, I think Retton didn't want an excuse. You knew you couldn't trust Spud because you feel yeah. like he's going to get... Spud would do all of it mind. immediately. Yeah, yeah. He, but also, like, any garbage that uh, he shot up of, like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the way I want to feel. Yeah. So Renton has the discerning taste, uh, and he's like, yeah. Okay. But then, of course, there's the the nervous bus ride where, you know, Renton, of course, goes into the bathroom and does a little One more, minute. you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, I love the, the sort of unease of that. Uh, they're not taking a train. They're taking a bus to London. They're taking think, a bus, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, save on expenses. I get it. You know, low yeah. overhead. That scene of them all in the shitter on the bus is really. That's just yeah, another I, one of those really. Be- it's like it's so beautiful and yet so gritty and disgusting all at the same time. Um, and I just I love that. I think it's yeah, when I uh, a few years after I saw this, I I did a backpacking trip around Europe and I went to Edinburgh and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's so much nicer than the train spot. I made me think it's beautiful, actually. You know. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I, Renton, I think in his narration uh, summarizes it, that, uh, the gangster that they meet with realized that this is perpetrated by three of the most useless fuck ups in town. You know, Mm -hmm. they, they knew exactly what the situation was, but they're able to be like, yeah, this is actually good shit. Yes, I can use it. Let's make a deal. Uh, I do love that Spud gets the sunglasses uh, at yes. this point in the, in yeah, the film I because do. he's, you know, he's big drug deal Spud. Yeah, um, but he's so that, cool. That nervous interaction while they're waiting because it is it's tense is the audience. I'm like, are they gonna? You know, look. A lot of times in movies, people will take the drugs and not pay you. Uh, somebody will get shot. You know, yeah. and it, the fact that it goes off without a hitch is like. Oh, that's kind of refreshing for this story, you know? You know, it's interesting that you say that. I did not feel a lot of tension during that scene. I don't think that I felt at any point like it was going to go bad. I felt like uh, our our buds, I felt like Renton and the gang were going to get ripped off. Like, I felt like they were going to get a really low price. But I I never at any point felt like somebody was going to pull a gun or, you know, it was going to be a shoot them up kind of moment. Although this movie is crime adjacent, it never felt like a crime movie to me. No. And, and, and so shout, I, I don't think I was expecting that at the end. But I thought at the very least they were going to get ripped off. Yes. And I do wonder, and let me know what you think, Kaylee, if somebody else was negotiating, like if Renton or Sick Boy was negotiating, do you think they could have gotten more Would than 16,000 pounds? Yeah. Because they, the guy had- Sick Boy, you know, absolutely. Especially yeah. if he was pimping at this point. Right. That's true. I, I mean, that's all, that's all marketing, right? So- yeah, and and yeah, and we know the importance of marketing. We hear yes, a lot about yeah. that. But I hear the, about it all the time, at least once yeah, a week. This according to my week. expertise. The, but the fact that he had more money in the suitcase, it, even Renton comments on that. It's like, oh, we probably could have gotten some more. But these four fuck ups get sixteen thousand pounds, yeah, and, and they celebrate. They sure do. <laughs> they sure do, and and Begley unsurprisingly does what he always does, which is attack an innocent dude because he well, loves fucking with and, people. And this is what I talked about earlier, that this is the moment where Renton knows that Begbie is a liability. But this is like, well, now we've come into this money and we really can't have the authorities looking twice at us. We have, you know, they'll be like, where'd this duffel bag full of 16,000 pounds come from? Yep. And I think that he's already alluding to it, you know, because uh, both Simon, sick boy and Begby leave them with the bag and like, hey, make sure it's still here when we come back. Ha 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 ha. No, seriously, I'll kill you. But that's the conversation that Renton has with Spud is yeah. like, well, what do you think? You think we should make a run for it? And Spud, like the childlike Spud that I referred to so much, hadn't even thought about it. What? Yeah. But as Renton says later, he it's like, well, sick boy is probably just pissed that he didn't do it first. He didn't think know? about it first. Yeah. Yeah. And 
the the way that that unfolds, I, the first time I saw it, I don't think I realized exactly what was about to happen, but just the way that he sneaks out. And of course, Begbie is cradling the- uh, Like a the baby. Bag, like a baby. And the fact that Mark's able to get it out from his arms is like, all right, that's pretty impressive. And Mark sneaking out under cover of Twilight uh, is very well filmed, but there's also the- just tragic shot of Spud with his eyes open. He sees Mark doing it and he's like crying. He's like telling him not to go. But what he doesn't do <sighs> is yell and wake up Begbie and- Because he knows it's gonna be much worse. And that's way worse. Yeah. And, you know, and then we get Mark walking off and choosing life with, yes. again, a- Look, if I had even sixteen thousand dollars all at once, it would be nice. Even in nineteen ninety six, it is not life changing. Fuck you, money. No, you know? <laughs> no, absolutely not. He defines his actions as a minor betrayal, and then he asks the question of why he does this. Yeah, um, and he says, "Well, because I'm a bad person." We don't grow on each other, but in the way that he somehow charmed us into liking him over these ninety minutes. Yeah, and I love the line in his narr narration is like, I'm going to be just like you. And it's reminding us, it's like, you know, we're not really that much better than him. You know, like, yes, we didn't do these exact things, but, you know, we're, we're such better people than he is. You know, we're yeah. better people than than Spud or Sick Boy. We're probably all better yeah. than Begbie, but, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Please. Well, and it, it's just sort of the way it ends. You're like, oh, wow. And I'm glad that there's sort of that extra moment where yes. we see Spud open the locker that we saw him hide his passport in earlier. Mm -hmm. And there's the 4,000 uh, pounds yep. for Spud. And uh, I believe that's the last image that we actually That is get the on. last image yeah. that we get. Uh, you know, Spud gets fucked through the whole film. So he's the one who goes to jail. He he has a lot of hard knocks, um, but he gets the money in the end. And that is, again, the final image that we get to see is Spud getting the money in the end. And yeah, it's, it's almost a peaceful scene at it, the end of such a chaotic film. Right. And, you know, Begbie's freaking out and trashing the hotel room. <laughs> And the police uh, show up and both Simon and Spud realize that we got to get out of here. Yeah. We cannot Absolutely. get dragged into yep. this. Yep. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you rewatched it and enjoyed it. Because yeah. if you hadn't enjoyed it, we still could have had, a, I think we still would have had a good conversation. It just would have been more of like, okay, but didn't this part look good? But it, it is probably a film that has aged reasonably well. Uh, I, I think it, it holds up very much in that way. And uh, I would be very interested in you checking out uh, the sequel. Yes, I can't wait to see it. Because uh, it, it will answer a lot of questions about where these characters are 20 years later. But these are not necessarily the characters that you thought you would get to see on the screen, but it taking 20 years to see them it is kind of nice to visit with them and uh, sort of dealing with Mark's actions 20 years later. Um, but uh, I've repeatedly I, heard that it is one of the best sequels. Of yeah, all time. right. Exactly. It has to, you have to do that thing where it's like, why are we making another one? Yeah. And a lot of times when your sequel comes out a year or two after the movie, it's being made for the wrong reasons, which all have yeah. dollar signs in the front of them, you know? Yeah. I, I I know we talked so much longer than you were planning, but which uh, is great because there's so much to talk about with this movie. There's really so much to this movie, and I hope that somebody watches this who's maybe seen it like you did and hasn't yeah. seen it in a while and thinks, okay, maybe I'll give it another try. On my channel, I like to do a ranking out of seven thumbs up for movies. So seven being the highest number of thumbs you could give to this. How many thumbs up would you give Train Spot in? You know, uh, watching it again uh, just this week, I can't see why I would give it any less than seven. You know, I mean, I, I think if you're going to poke a couple holes in it, I could go down to like six and a half. But at that point, it's like, let's just leave it. Um, I think that 
there are very few movies where you're like, this movie is perfect. Can I get an eighth thumb for that? You know, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I think that uh, for me, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because it perfectly tells the story it's set out to tell. It is not a perfect movie, but it is an excellent movie on every level, visually, storytelling, performances, all the acting in it is great. I think that that is a completely reasonable rating. I would also give this a seven thumbs up, which if you had asked me based on memory to rate it, I probably would have been like, yeah, it's a three or a four. Okay. You know, I, I, think, I think it was visually pleasing, but I didn't really get it. I am so glad that you suggested that we talk about this film because it was a pleasure to rewatch and it is now one that I am definitely going to be rewatching again and again. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I helped you. I helped you fall in love with this movie. The you way really, had. really did. And, you absolutely and, did. And I hope I've uh, sold you on the uh, sequel. And I am very much celebrating you today because you suggested that we watch this movie and because you do so many other incredible things. So will you please tell everybody um, a little bit about who you are, what you do, and where everybody can find you? Yes, well, uh, for people who know you as your superhero character, Lucy Type, box uh yes. you would enjoy who are these broadcasters a show that i do with eric zane uh every tuesday at 2 p.m eastern 11 a.m pacific and it does also have its own audio feed if you just want to subscribe in that way i have to get better at marketing and mentioning that there is also <laughs> an audio version we do play video clips but i do get i hear from people who only listen to it and i've asked i'm like do you feel that it's too visual he's like a couple times in an episode yeah but in general you guys do a good job explaining the clips so uh that's that show is a lot of fun uh, that uh, we get to do every week on the Who Are These Podcasts YouTube channel and its own audio feed. And then I have my podcast, The Black Cast, B-L-A-D-T-C-A-S-T. We talk about a lot of movies. We do also talk about uh, a lot of specifically like nerdy movies and things. But uh, Kaylee, you were on not too long ago, right before the Academy Awards, and we talked about Maestro which yes, uh, sure I had did. not seen at that point. And uh, I was glad that we were able to do that. So uh, check that out, B-L-A-D-T-C-A-S-T. Uh, I also do a number of musician interviews. I know you saw the one I did with George Lynch. It's so uh, good. I very recently uh, was fortunate enough to be asked if I would talk to Ricky Medlock from Blackfoot and Leonard Skinner. And I was oh. like, sure. You know, I was like, I would be happy to speak with him. So it's like, he only has 25 minutes. I'm like, you could have told me five and I would have Yeah, said and yes. you would have been ecstatic yeah. about it. That's so, amazing. Yeah, Looking so, forward to it. Yeah, so I got, I got plenty of stuff over there. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ. Uh, and thank you, Kaylee. Uh, it's, I'm glad that we've been talking about this for a while. And I'm Yes, we that, have. Uh, we've been talking about it for longer than the movie would last. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Oops. So I'm, I'm glad we, uh, no, no, I mean, we've been talking about doing this episode for Ah, uh, yes, so that yes, is well. Our wrap up is longer than the episode, but yes. also us talking about doing it is longer than seven weeks of production they went into see how i tied it back to your yeah you beginning. got there it was perfect um no i am i'm just so happy that we finally got to make this happen and that i had the opportunity to rewatch this because of you so thank you so so much and thank you guys all for watching <laughs> Ich bin auch, ich bin auch, ich bin auch.